And this week I, I got word that a, a pastoral colleague, um, Greg Strawbridge, that he, he died at the age of 57 of a, of a heart attack. And, and when, I, when I start hearing of my contemporaries that, that uh, pass away and, and die, it, it always kind of grips you a little bit. And you think about, um, you know, my life, okay, I'm, I'm not much different. And uh, you wonder, you know, is that heart palpitation? Is that, is that real? Or maybe I better have that checked out. Or um, I probably better go exercise a little bit more. Uh, one day, the reality is one day we're all going to stand before God on Judgment Day. And, and we're going to cry out, you know, Lord, Lord. <laughs> and what kind of response are we going to hear from, from God? What kind of response will we have? This, this January, we've been talking about really kind of a series of, of messages that we talk about what it means to be a disciple and the goals that a disciple would have. And this sermon series is really part of, of the vision that I have as a pastor for the Hernando Church. Because one of the things that I think is really important for us is that we recognize, we understand that what Jesus is calling us to. Jesus is calling us to be his disciples and what does that look like and how's that played out? That's what we've been talking about the last several weeks. Uh, what, what is a disciple of Jesus? What does a disciple do? And, and so we've talked about three particular goals that a disciple of Jesus might have. And I don't know if, if you remember those. Does any of you remember some of those goals? Is there one person that might remember one of the goals that we have? Is a disciple is one who's going to be with Jesus. A disciple is one who has a goal to become like Jesus. And a disciple of Jesus is one who has a goal to do the things that Jesus did. And so we repeat those over and over again. And if nobody responds, I'll just keep repeating them over and over again until you get so sick and tired of hearing them over and over again. You're going to say, okay, enough, enough. I've heard it. I believe it. Okay, move on. Can you give something else? Well, Jesus, was a, he's a rabbi. He's a teacher. He's, he's the master. And he's invited us, just like he invited people to follow him and to be with him in his day. He's calling us into a relationship where we can be, you know, the students of the rabbi, students of the teacher. We can be disciples. We can be an apprentice, so to speak, of what it means to be the, the, the rabbi, of how to live like the rabbi, how to become like the rabbi. Now, one of the things I think it's easy for us in America is, is we get comfortable watching people do things. We get comfortable, especially like during COVID, there was this huge spike of uh, television programming and uh, videos that, that people would view about like travel channels, you know, travel videos and travel shows where you could go to Peru from your living room and you could see, you know, as you sat right there in your living room and eating popcorn, you could, you could see Peru and travel around. You never had to deal with customs and all that sort of thing. But, but we were kind of bored and, and kind of tired of, of being cooped up. And so this gave us an opportunity to, to look out beyond ourselves and do some other things. And so these, these uh, you know, sitting around watching travel shows or watching cooking shows, you know, we had an increase of that, you know, where, you know, you couldn't find things in the store sometimes, but you'd sit around and watch, you know, some of these people cook and, and create, you know, dinners and, and suppers and, and meals. It would be pretty exciting. Um, maybe even restoring old houses. You've seen some of that before, where you, you sit around and you watch that, and you see all the work and all the effort that they go into, and, and boy, I'm glad they're doing that. I'm glad that's all on them, and I don't have to do it. But, but sometimes it's exciting. I'd like to do that, but I really don't want to do all of that. And, and, you know, like this day, I happened to bring something else. <laughs> Some of you maybe notice this here in the front. This happens to be a jersey of, of a Patrick Mahomes. And I'll just bring it here to church because it, it reminds me of millions and millions of people that are going to be watching uh, some football games this afternoon, right? Um, just literally millions of people around the world and so many are watching these ball games and excited about, you know, watching, watching my Chiefs get back into the Super Bowl. Now, <clears throat> you notice how I said that, my Chiefs, right? And we have that way of, that's how we talk, isn't it? 
We talk about my team and how we won last week and how we are playing next week and how we are doing this and how, as if I'm a Kansas City Chief. Now, if you've ever been around some of those football players and, and then you see me and my size, you, you quickly recognize there is no way <laughs> I'm a Kansas City Chief. You know, I used to go to those training camps when I lived in Kansas when I was in high school. A friend of mine, we'd, we'd drive up to, to where they'd have their training camp and we'd, we'd watch these players and, and these quarterbacks that we thought were just small little, little guys. We'd get and look at them like, you're six foot four, 225 pounds, wow, it's amazing. Um, but we talk like that as spectators, right, about our team and how we play. But really, all I'm doing is sitting on the couch, hooping and hollering, that's all I'm doing. I'm not out playing. I'm not making any tackles. I haven't played football, you know, competitively since high school. You know, so there's, there's nothing that I'm doing. But a lot of us, I think, when it comes to being a disciple of Jesus, we've kind of privatized what it means to follow Jesus, and we've, we've made it more of a, a private, personal matter, almost a spectator sport, rather than actually doing what Jesus calls us to do. So why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say, Jesus asked. You know, it's easy for us to sit on the sidelines and to cheer on maybe others and to critique. You know, I'm pretty good at that. Why did that coach do that? Get Dan Sorensen out of there. He can't cover anybody, you know. So I'm, I'm critiquing as if I'm right there, as if my opinion matters, if I know anything. And a lot of us do that even when it comes to following Christ. Well, that dumb pastor, he doesn't know what he's doing. Why did the church board vote to do that? That's so stupid. You know, we sit on the sidelines and we make all of our critique and criticism, but do we actually get in the game? Do we actually do what we've been called to do? As an apprentice of Jesus, we're, we're not just called to follow Jesus in spirit, but we're, we're called to continue the work that he begun when he was here. To see heaven come down here on earth and to see his will being done here on earth as it is in heaven and this means as we read through the gospels healing the sick praying for the lost opening up our homes to people who are far from god the end goal for all of us as disciples and followers of jesus is to do the things that jesus did and i expected it to be pretty quiet i didn't expect a lot of amens on that but let's turn to our Bibles, if you have your Bibles and, and want to follow along. If not, I'm going to read these scriptures from Matthew 9, because I'm going to take one example of a disciple of Jesus and how Jesus called Matthew, and then how this worked out in his life. Matthew 9, beginning at verse 9 through 13, Jesus went on from there. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. Verse 10, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need the doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. I think it's important for us to remember that a tax collector, they were really a, a traitor. They were a traitor to, to the, the people of Israel because they were either siding up with the, the foreign occupying uh, government of Rome or they, were, or they were saddling themselves up and working for King Herod, who was a corrupt, you know, terrible leader. So in whichever case that they were serving as a tax collector, Matthew was viewed as a traitor. He was viewed as, as, a, as a sinner. Somebody, somebody who was seriously into God would have nothing to do with somebody like Matthew. He was dirty, disgusting sinner, have nothing to do with him. Every God-fearing person would avoid people like Matthew, but not Jesus. Jesus comes on the scene and he calls Matthew to, to come and follow me. Come be my disciple. Come be my apprentice. And Jesus, I think it's also interesting, Jesus doesn't ask him to, to kneel at the altar of prayer. He doesn't ask him to sign a decision card. Jesus simply invites Matthew to come follow me. And we see that over and over again as we read through the, 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 the Gospels. 
you'll see this pattern of how Jesus calls his disciples. He invites them to come be with him so that they can become like him, so that they can do what Jesus is doing. As we continue reading down in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers in the harvest field. So as we read through these, these Gospels, I want us to begin to read through them with new eyes. I want, I want us to see the things that Jesus is doing and how he's ministering, how he's working. I want us to connect with those disciples and recognize how Jesus, if he's talking to us as a disciple, how he might have those same kind of ex- expectations for us to put into practice what Jesus is doing. Jesus is teaching. He's proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is available. It's near. It's available to anybody. Even these dirty sinners like Matthew, you can come and you can be a part of the kingdom of God. This is good news. This is something that's exciting. And and Jesus heals the sick. He shows compassion. We talked about in our our discussion this morning during Sunday school, we talked about care. Jesus cared for people. And he demonstrated that care, even people who are far from God. And I think this, we, need, we recognize that this needs to be the work of, of people like you and I who are disciples of Jesus. In verse 37, Jesus is saying we need more workers. You can almost imagine Jesus working and healing and, and preaching and talking and, and ministering to people and the crowds just keep pressing in on around him. And you can imagine Jesus in his humanness, he's saying, look at me, I can't do this by myself. I need help. We need workers to go out and do what I'm trying to do because I can't. I'm just one man. I can't do it on my own. We need workers. We need to ask the Father to send out some workers to go out into the harvest field. And so we have some of that same prayer, don't we, today? We're praying, God, send some workers. We need some more people to join us. The harvest field is vast. The number of people who need Christ is, is incredible. The amount of work that we need, the amount of work that needs to be done is, is just we, we can't scratch the surface on it. We need help, God. Send us some workers. And, and the Greek word, I didn't put the Greek word up on the screen. I'm sorry. We've been, we've been showing you one Greek word each week, but I failed here. The Greek word for send out is apostolos. You, you know that word, right? We get the word apostles to send out. It's the same root word for missionary, mission. So it'd be sent out, to be sent out on mission. So as we continue reading, as you turn to the next chapter, Matthew chapter 10, Jesus calls his 12 disciples to him, and he gave them authority to drive out impure spirits, to heal every disease and sickness. Verse 2, these are the names of the 12 apostles, the sent out ones, the missionaries. First Simon, who's called Peter, and his brother Andrew... James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And as you go, and this is, this is a kind of a key word too, because we have the same word, being used in the Great Commission, as you go, as you're going, proclaim this message. Here's what the disciples, here's what you and I are to be doing. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Verse 8. Tell me if this is in your Bible too. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Isn't that a great line? Freely you have received, so freely give. Now we like to use that, preachers like to use that, when we're trying to raise money, right? You've received, look at all that you've received, now you've been blessed materially, right? So you need to turn around and give generously. And that's all true, and that's all good. But it just doesn't go to apply only to money. It also applies to how we serve how we work freely we have received 
the love of God. Freely we have received salvation that we didn't deserve. Freely we have received all the goodness of God and the promise of eternity in heaven with Him. Freely we have received. Now freely go and give and share. I got one amen. I was concerned because Nancy's not with us here if I'm going to get some amens going, but, but I'll keep working. Let me keep... Somebody told me if you'd preach better, maybe we'd get more amens going, but... Uh, I'll keep going. I'll, I'll try to wind it up and get a little better here. Matthew 28. What we know is the Great Commission, beginning of verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went to, to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. And as you go, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus promises to be with us as we go, as we minister, as we are sent out. He promises to be with us through his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is crucial here. We can't just forget the dependence we have on the Holy Spirit. But Jesus comes, he proclaims the kingdom of God is nearby. And this is good news. It's good news because we live in a world that's not the kingdom of God. <laughs> There's a lot of problems around, right? You see the cities and you see the murder and you see the, the outrage of what's going on. You can walk and you can see people who are addicted to drugs and alcohol. And, and their lives are, are a shattered mess. You see the families that are broken, homes that are broken, lives that are being destroyed, and they're, they're just down a terrible path. We, we don't see the kingdom of God in its fullness, in its consummation here, do we? So we've got work to do as we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done here in Citrus County as it is in heaven. We've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of work to, to be involved in, and we've got plenty to do. Somebody asked me last week if I thought Jesus was coming soon, and I, I don't really know. I don't know if Jesus is coming soon, but I do know this. We've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of work to do before we see the righteousness of God cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. We've got a lot of work to do before we see the, the small, tiny mustard seed grow into the largest garden plant and all the birds of the air rest in its branches. We've got a lot of work to do. So that we haven't run out of work, for sure. There's plenty for us to be involved in. But one of the things that, that I want to make note, and I hope that you see as you read through the Gospels, I hope you see as Jesus proclaims the Gospel that the kingdom of God is at hand. When Jesus preaches that, when he proclaims that message out there, there's also a demonstration of the Gospel that almost always goes hand in hand. When Jesus preaches, he's also healing and demonstrating the power of the Gospel. Over and over again, we see it. And, and I think it's interesting because it's not just in Jesus' life, but then we see it in those early disciples and how they would preach and proclaim the gospel, and it would be demonstrated in power. And what's, what's fascinating, too, is to pick up the history books and read about the early church, and we'd read about how these converted slaves who were still serving as slaves, how they would operate in great power and because of the demonstration of the gospel, because of this radical life transformation that would take place in their life, the, the, the slave owners, they would be amazed. What has happened to you? Look at how you've changed. Look at how you're living, how you're operating with love and kindness. I, and they'd be drawn to that. A demonstration of the gospel being lived out in their life. Healing the sick, casting out demons, proclaiming the gospel demonstrating the gospel. This is the great commission for all of us. All of us. So Jesus is calling you and I to follow him. Jesus is calling us to be his disciples. He's calling us to be his students. He's calling us to, to, to go and be with him, to, to, 
to share the good news, to be a witness to the good news at every opportunity. And as you read the Gospels, I hope you'll see this pattern of Jesus making disciples and sort of the, the stages of apprenticeship, kind of stages of mentoring that maybe you've seen before. You know, this isn't anything new necessarily. Some of you have seen this in, in your workplace environment before. I do and you watch. I do and you help. You do and I help. You do and I watch. So you can imagine the disciples are following Jesus and, and Jesus saying, you know, watch me, see what I'm doing, see how I'm preaching, see how I'm healing, see exactly what I'm involved in, see how I'm living my life. And then Jesus involves them, and you can see that, like, like when he's feeding the 5,000, he says, okay, um, here, take a basket and go, go distribute the food. So they get involved, they get hands-on, and Jesus is there. And then he sends them out, now you go out and do it. I give you authority, you go out and do it. And they come back, and, and they report back of what they heard. And I like in Luke 10, when the disciples return, they're all excited. Lord, you can't believe it. The demons, they, they fled when we began to cast them out in your name. It's amazing. This is exciting. And Jesus said, well, okay, that's good, but, but don't get too excited over that. What you ought to be most excited about is that your names are written down in heaven. And so he begins to you know, give them some feedback of how this works. Sometimes... You see them, that they struggled. Well, how, we couldn't figure this out. We couldn't cast that demon out. And Jesus said, hey, this, this requires prayer. Some translation says fasting, prayer and fasting. Uh, so you see this debriefing as uh, Jesus is discipling people. This is what you know, I'm trying to do with like Pastor Josh. You know, he comes here, he's got a call in his life to be a pastor. And so I want to I show him you know, what I do and how I do it. And so, like yesterday, we had a nominating committee. And so we gathered around, the nominating committee gathered around and invited him in so he could see what we're doing. So he could see how things are being done. And, and then he could learn all the mistakes that I make and what things to avoid, right? <laughs> I'm not going to do it like that. Check that one down. <laughs> I'm not going to make that same mistake. And so hopefully, as he has opportunity, and when he preaches, or when he leads a meeting, or whatever, then we can have some talk back afterwards and say, well, you know, I would have done it, and I think it might have been better, and hey, I think you did a good job here, and, and, and this is all part of that discipleship process, right? It's something that all of us are to be involved in, right? Follow me as I follow Christ. Jesus expects us to to kind of be leading others along this, this pathway of, of discipling others. You think about how we're helping guide and direct others. This is the pattern we see in Scripture of what it means to be a disciple, to become like the rabbi and do what the rabbi does. You know, I would, I'm not satisfied that I go to a doctor and he, he's got on his wall um, his grade, grades when he was in a graduate school, a medical school, I'm not all that interested to see, you know, his test scores. I want him to, to be able to practice medicine on me. I want to know that he's had some experience in the past practicing medicine with, with a trained, certified doctor who showed him how to do it. I don't want somebody who's just read a book to start practicing medicine on me. I want somebody who's had some hands-on experience. And, and God's calling all of us to do his work that he's left us to do here in this world. And so we're to be involved in, in this, this ministry that Jesus started here of proclaiming the gospel and the good news to others that the kingdom of God is here and demonstrating that gospel with works. Our, if our version of the gospel, if our version of calling people to Christ doesn't also involve discipleship, then we're not preaching the gospel of Jesus. If we're not, if we're not teaching people that make a decision and follow Christ means you're going to be a disciple. If we're not teaching them that you've got to be a disciple, then we're really not teaching them the gospel that Jesus taught. Following Christ involves discipleship. There's no two ways around it. The end goal is to do what Jesus did. And as you read the Gospels, you see him proclaiming the Gospel. You see him teaching, healing the sick, casting out demons, eating with people who are far from God, standing up against political corruption, religious corruption, 
speaking out against injustice over and over again. Well, there's a story from a man who died a, a few years ago by the name of John Wimber. And, and I got to hear him tell his story once. And I, and I know John Wimber, some of you might be familiar with that name, but, but John Wimber was a professional musician from Southern California, late 50s, early 60s. He, he played um, with the Righteous Brothers. You know, some of you maybe have heard of that. He was playing a circuit in Las Vegas, and, and God began to grip his heart. His marriage was a mess. His life was a mess. Even though here he is musically and, and uh, on, on this road, he's doing really well, but, but personally, it was, it was a disaster. And he said he described himself as a beer-guzzling, drug-abusing pop musician who became converted at the age of 29 while chain-smoking his way through a Quaker-led Bible study. He became a voracious Bible reader. And, and he tells a little bit of his story. And, and rather than me tell it, I thought I'd just give, give you a couple minutes of listening to his, his story here. So we have it that uh, I think we're going to share it this time. As I read the New Testament, I fell in love with Jesus. Didn't you? I liked him. I liked what he was like. I liked the things he did. I liked the things he said. Didn't you like those things? I thought that stuff was hot. I liked it when he multiplied the bread. You like that one? Huh? How about it? You like that? And the fishes, you know, the sardines. I always picture sardines. I like that stuff. I like all that stuff, you know? I liked it when he went by the fig tree and said, hmm. You know? <laughs> and it died. Can you picture him doing that? I like all that stuff. I like it. I remember last night, come forth. That's a biggie, you know? I mean, that's hot. There's not many guys doing that come forth thing, you know, telling anybody to come up from the dead. I like all that stuff. And when I became a Christian, I thought that's what I was going to do. I spent several weeks reading the New Testament and talking with these people, and I thought, this is great. You know, I'm going to join up. I want to do this stuff. And so I remember the frustration of attending church the first few times. You know what I thought they did at church? I thought you, that people gathered at the church, had a good time together, sort of divvied up the land, and everybody went out and healed a few, cast out a few demons, and won a few people to Christ before lunch. And so the first few times I went to church, I went prepared with the idea that we're going to, you know, ha, I'm going to take Anaheim. I want to go to Anaheim, you know, the deepest, darkest pagan Anaheim over there by Disneyland. That's where I want to go because that's where I was raised. And when they didn't do it, I was disappointed. And I remember one day asking a guy about it. I said, well, when do we go out and do it? He said, what? I said, when do we go out and do it? He says, oh, you don't have to do it. You just have to believe it was done once. Now that's pathetic, <laughs> isn't it? I found out over the next year or two that we cried about it, we sang about it, we preached about it, we prayed over it, we gave to it, but we never did it. We never got to go do the things that Jesus did. And I grew disillusioned in the process. Now, you know, when I worked for the devil, he let me do his stuff. <laughs> Didn't he let you do his stuff? He let me do his stuff. But when I came to work for Jesus, they didn't want to let me do his stuff. And I, to tell you the truth, I joined up to do the stuff. Did you? You see, it's doing the stuff that's going to change the world. It's not knowing it was done once. It's not knowing that it's important. It's doing it that's going to change the world. Somewhere, someplace, somebody's got to start believing this book and acting on it. And I figure it might as well be us. We're qualified. And we understand that it can be done.
end up with Jesus so he could do the stuff. Everybody who wanted to be a disciple of a rabbi, they wanted to become like the rabbi, and they wanted to go do what the rabbi was doing. And the disciples of Jesus, when they saw what he was doing, that's what they expected as well. And so it was no surprise for them when, when he sent them out to go and heal the sick and proclaim the, the kingdom of God and, and to raise the dead and do all of those things. It was no surprise to them because they'd been seeing Jesus do that. And the early church picked it up from the apostles and they were carrying the same kind of stuff out. But somehow or another, we forgot about doing the stuff. And we become pretty good about having Bible studies about it and singing about it and talking about it and raising money to go send somebody else out to go do it, but to not to actually do it ourselves. Jesus was God. Fully 100% God. But he was also fully 100% man. And you, you think the incarnation, Jesus sort of set aside his God card to embrace humanity. Philippians chapter 2 talks about how he, how he humbled himself to become man. How he kind of set aside this God aspect of, of his identity and who he was so that he could embrace humanity and show us what, what humanity was supposed to live like. Now Jesus did all that he did through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's given us that same authority and made available that same Holy Spirit. That we can use that same Spirit too. That we can operate in that same Spirit. That we can live this incredibly transformed life just like Jesus. You see, there's, we call ourselves a holiness church. And that, that has a lot of different connotations. But one of the things that that means is we believe that Jesus can radically transform and change us from the inside out. We believe that, you know, once I was lost and blind, but God can, he can heal me. He can, he can give me new sight to see spiritual realities. That he can change my hard heart that used to get angry and fly off the handle. He can change that. And he can give me joy and peace. We believe that. We're a holiness church because we believe that, that it's, it's possible, that it's actually expected from followers of Jesus to be transformed and changed like that. But the problem is we see so little of it, I'm afraid, in our churches. We talk about holiness, but we see very little of it being lived out. We talk about radical transformation, but we see very little of it lived out. We still see these same people who, who claim to be saved and sanctified. We see them have this carnal anger and bitterness and resentment, just like the rest of the world. We see them sucked into the same kind of nonsense that the world gets sucked into. And they go, well, there's really not much difference. And we talk about the power of God to heal and to save and to bring new life. But we kind of proclaim it softly because I think we really don't believe too seriously that it can happen. And, and somebody will come and say, Hey, I know that you're a Christian. Will you pray for me? And we pray, but we have a whole lot of doubt that God can really do anything about it or that God will do anything about it. So if we're following Jesus, if we're his disciples, we need to, we need to adopt all that Jesus taught us, right? The transformation, the holy life from the inside out, as well as the responsibility to go out and do what he's called us to do. The problem is, we live in a world that's pretty hostile to this kind of living, though. And we can talk here, and we can be bold and brave and strong here, but we walk out the doors, and then all of a sudden, eh, I don't want to go talk to my neighbor. <laughs> I, know what, I know what kind of response I'm going to get. When I start talking about Jesus, he shuts the door, he's not interested, he walks away. You know, and somebody asked me to, you know, hey, I, I've got a... A loved one who's sick, will you pray for them? And yeah, we, we might pray, but we really don't pray believing and expecting that God's going to do anything. We hear the preacher say, we need, we need to rally around, we need to come together, we need to join together and be the body of Christ. And, 
yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do what I can. How are we supposed to be the people of God, the people of Jesus in 2022 living here in Citrus County? How is this supposed to happen? I just got a couple of observations I'll close with this morning. How, how do we do this? First of all, the only way we can do anything is by the Holy Spirit. So we've got to avail ourselves to the means of grace. We've got to seek God with all of our heart. We've got to, we've got to be connected to the vine. Because without him, we can do nothing. And so whether it's teaching or proclaiming the good news of the kingdom or healing the sick or, or living together as the body of Christ in community, loving one another, serving one we can't do any of that without the Holy Spirit. And there's a lot of churches that try to do it without the Holy Spirit, and we got a lot of divisions, we got a lot of infighting, we got a lot of slander and gossip and complaining and belly aching and grumbling that goes on. And that's living without the Holy Spirit. Because you can't live and walk by the Spirit and have those things present. Those aren't my words. Those are in the book. So we need the Holy Spirit if we're going to do anything. Secondly, we need to know our stage of discipleship and our season of life. Now, I know sometimes you, you, you preach a message like this and, and, and it becomes, you, you sort of feel guilty. And, and you think, well, the preacher's up there and he's talking, and I think should, ought, must, and ah, I can't. As we get older, at least I, I experience this, as I get older, I don't have the same kind of energy I used to have. I don't have the same kind of drive, and, and I'm not able to do some of the things that I used to do. And I think that's maybe true for some of you as well. But God understands that. He knows, your, he knows your age and your stage of life and where you're at. And he's well aware of that. And so he still, he doesn't want you to do what, what a 25-year-old person can do. But he wants you to do what you can do in your position, in your stage of life. And so don't, don't feel guilty about what you can't do, but, but recognize what it is that he wants me to do here and now. And, and do it. And, and maybe, number three, we could just start with some basics. You know, we don't, we don't need to overcomplicate this. And, and one of the things that I brought up here, this book that, that I'm rereading here, Tim Chester's book, A Meal with Jesus, and, and he makes this big point that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Amen? The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost, but also the Son of, the man, son of man came eating and drinking with lost people. And he was accused and ridiculed for that. And Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. That was, his, that was his vision, right? And his strategy was by eating and drinking with the lost, he was able to communicate. He was able to show that he cares. He was able to listen to them. He was able to, to proclaim to them and show them there is a better way. That the kingdom of God's available for even them. And so sharing a meal and listening in conversation with your neighbors, that's, that's kind of basic. It's something that all of us can do. We don't have to go to seminary to, to share a meal with somebody, to listen to somebody, right? Over and over again in Scripture, we have this practice hospitality. Practice hospitality. Do not forget to practice hospitality. That's important. It's important for, it's part of Jesus' strategy, and I think it ought to be part of our strategy as well. There's a couple, Ray and Shirley Stevenson, and you know them. Um, one of the things, if you know them very well at all, is they like to show examples of hospitality by getting together and sharing a meal with, with people. And, and they, if you're new to the church, a lot of times they'll, they'll pick you out and say, hey, would you have lunch plans today? And very simple like that. You'll go out and share a meal with Ray and Shirley Stevenson. Now, they're, I'm not going to tell their age, but, but they're older than I am. And they may not have the energy that they once had, but, but this is something they can do, and it's something that they do do. Doing the things that Jesus did, right? In a real simple way, loving one another. The greatest command is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. I kind of think that... that God means this literally. Would you agree with me? That we're to love God and, and love our neighbor in a, in a literal, practical way? 
that we, that we come together and we worship God and we, we express to Him our love, but also we actually do something for our neighbor, that we demonstrate something helpful or something even small. I'm, I'm afraid sometimes we make mission too complicated and too complex, and, and it's only for those highly professional people like Dale and Pat Stotler. Those are the only kind of people who can really do missions work, and it's not for me. But as I read the Bible, as I read what Jesus did, I think he expects all of us to be missionaries. Maybe we don't have to go to Africa. Maybe we just go across the street. Maybe we go next door. Maybe we could uh, go across the aisle to somebody that maybe we don't know, even in our own congregation. I see this couple over here. I don't know, that I, I know their names. Let me go and invite them for a meal. Let me, let me just listen to them. Let, let me get to know them. As you read the Gospels, I think you'll find Jesus doing most of his ministry in times of interruption. And that's one of the things that it's hard for me to, to get a grasp on. I still struggle with that sometimes because, you know, as I start the week, I've got this to do, this to do, this to do, this to do. I wake up in the morning, I got okay, this, this, this. I got my list of things I got to do. And ministry comes as he's walking along the road. Somebody comes and says, hey, will you heal my son? Will you, can you... Touch me for here. Can you take care of this? And this needs to pop up all the time. As you're going, as you're living through life, you're going to come with these opportunities to minister. And you've got an opportunity to either take the time to minister or to keep on your own agenda. I think it's important for us to, to recognize how Jesus did it. And so as we read the Gospels, I, I hope that it just soaks into our heart and our life. Proclaiming the good news about the kingdom of God. Casting out demons, healing the sick. All that stuff seems to come even in interruptions. But that's the way of Jesus. So the Great Commission, as you are going, as you are living, look for opportunities to make disciples. Look for opportunities to do what Jesus did. To do the stuff, John Wimber said. We get to do the stuff. Isn't that exciting? God's called us to be a part of, of his work. He left us to finish the work that he started to go out and do the stuff that he was doing. But my prayer is, for me, is, Father, help me slow down to see what you're doing through your Holy Spirit. Help me slow down and recognize where you're working and how I can join together and help. And, Father, give me the courage to step out and risk and be involved in ministry that Jesus was involved in because a lot of times I get nervous and I get scared. I want us to close by, by looking at that passage we started with there in Luke. Luke chapter 6. Maybe we could read that together as the worship team comes. Let's read this passage of scripture together. Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. He is like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When the flood came and the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. Father, help us. Help us to have eyes to see where you're working and where we can join you to do what you're doing. Well, if you'd like, why don't we stand and sing one more song in worship? This may be a bit of a new one to us this morning. Uh, perhaps as you're listening to the words, it's an opportunity to reflect on what God has done for us, freely given. Now, go and freely give. My world was shaking 
Let's go in his peace and go and do his work. Amen. <laughs>